Good morning and a very warm welcome to the conference Investing in Europe, Europe's Green Digital Future. Um, we are welcoming you all on screen. This is a hybrid event. There are a few of us here at DRW in Berlin, um, whom I will introduce shortly. But uh, most of you will be joining us via live stream uh, and online. And um, we also, of course, will want to in in involve you and your questions, uh, but more to that later on. Um, I'm very happy to announce that this is a joint conference between the European Investment Bank, um, Werner Hoyer, I'm welcoming very warmly here the president who's here in Berlin and will uh, deliver the keynote, the first keynote of the day, uh, and also as a second partner, uh, the, um, the representation of the European Commission uh, here in Berlin, and um, I think very much uh, Nicola Brandt for being here and for moderating the, the conference, uh, and so she will speak to this as, and also take your questions and moderate the talk. We are in the midst of a pandemic and uh, still the economic crisis that we had hoped in the first wave uh, would dissipate um, in the summer now has come back in full force. So we are seeing the second wave in many countries being a lot tougher uh, than even the first, uh, and um, the economy particular in Europe uh, is in danger again to contract, to go back into recession. So we're in a very, very difficult spot to where policymakers are trying everything to stabilize the economy and to prevent worse, to prevent company defaults, to prevent unemployment, and of course also on the health side to uh, make sure that as few people as possible are infected. The, one of the risks is that we um, in the attempt to stabilize the economy in the short run, uh, that we forget or that we um, prioritize less on the future structural transformation that we are facing in all of European economies. Uh, and I, I want to highlight four key economic and political economy challenges in the years ahead. One is, of course, the, the transformation concerning climate protection, environmental protection, um, the European Commission with the Green New Deal has put forward a big and ambitious initiative. The second big challenge, structural transformation, is the one related to digitalization, to technological change that will change many jobs, will change many sectors of our European economy. The third challenge is the transformation of our social security systems, of our social protection systems. And we have seen in this pandemic how important uh, social protection is and, and how much it can buffer and prevent worse economic, social and health outcomes in a pandemic like that. And the fourth big challenge I see is the global cooperation, multilateralism, um, many aspects but of course also on the economy I have seen many issues related to trade, trade conflicts related to taxation. Um, and looking at the future and, and trying to understand how we can, challenge, uh, can manage these challenges, it is very important that we think of what investment is needed in Europe and in each individual member state uh, to tackle those, those needs. Uh, and the um, reconstruction and resilience fund that will hopefully be agreed very soon and, and also be implemented very soon uh, of course plays a very important role. So uh, my point is that even though we have seen big challenges over the past 10 years in terms of fostering investment, fostering convergence within Europe, we face equally strong challenges in the 10 years ahead related to these four challenges of climate protection, digital transformation, transformation of our social security systems and strengthening global cooperation. Um, and we want to highlight some of these aspects uh, during uh, today's conference. Uh, we're very happy, as I said, to have Werner Hoyer, the president of European Investment Bank, deliver the first keynote. Uh, we have Vlad uh, Valdis Dombrovskis, the executive vice president of the European Commission, who will de deliver the second keynote at um, 20 past uh, 11. And then we have uh, Mariana Mazzucato uh, delivering the third keynote, plus a number of panelists that um, and Nicola Brandt will introduce uh, ahead of each of the panel. So I think we have a, what I want to highlight is to me the big challenge to look ahead, to look beyond the current crisis and try to understand what we need to do in Europe to uh, establish Europe in a global context, competing with the United States and with China, but also cooperating with them 
and the role of investment. Um, so this, very briefly, to the framework. Again, I welcome you very warmly. Um, and with that, I um, will now directly uh, um, give the words to Werner Hoyer. Is that correct? Uh, or you want to introduce him, Nicola? No? Um, I think Werner Hoyer needs a little introduction. All of you know him. Uh, he's the president of the European Investment Bank. Um, um, I think he has lived in Bonn for a long time, has been in German government, in the German foreign ministry, uh, before taking his current post. Uh, and without much further ado, again, thank you very much for doing this conference with us jointly, and we are very happy that you are here to deliver the keynote. Please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Professor Fratscher, for this kind introduction and for hosting us here again at DIW. It's a pleasure to be here and uh, to look into the future, but also to celebrate a big achievement of the last couple of years, because the subtitle of this conference, I think, is uh, a Legacy of Market Impact, FC. So, and I'm going to begin this uh, talk a little bit with a look back at that and draw some conclusions for what needs to be done in the future. Uh, excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, when scientists complete an experiment, they examine the results to see if their original hypothesis is supported. At the European Investment Bank, we are at the end of a great exper experiment whose findings will play a major role in investment finance across all sectors in the coming years. Our hypothesis was that by transforming public grant money into a guarantee, we could multiply the impact of the public money on the real economy many times over. I'm able to tell you today that our hypothesis is truly supported by the investment results and that the effect has been significant on all sectors of the economy, not least the digital economy. The experiment is the European Fund for Strategic Investments, the main financial pillar of the investment plan for Europe. With a guarantee from the EU budget, FC, or the Juncker plan, as this instrument is known, has supported more than 500 billion euro in investment across Europe since 2015. 500 billion euros. Of course, in reality, we don't have an experiment in the strictest sense where we randomly decided that some projects should receive FC support and others not. But still, we tried to come as close to such an experiment as possible. For example, the investment committee of FC looked at every project ex ante whether it would not be able to go ahead in the same form without FC support, and only if the answer was yes, granted the guarantee. That in itself ensures additionality. Additionality and impact being the key words for the work of our institution nowadays. Also in our ex post evaluations, our economists went through great lengths to look at the value added, and the answer is truly remarkable. In fact, this experiment has been so successful that it has become the blueprint for subsequent economic stimulus programs. You will find the EFC's DNA in the InvestEU program and, of course, the Pan-European Guarantee Fund, which, with which the European Investment Bank aims to support up to 2 billion euro of emergency financing over the next year to counter the effects of the COVID-19 crisis. And I should note that the second quarter of 2020 saw the biggest ever increase in FC investment mobilized. This was because the FC guarantee stood behind so much of the European Investment Bank's extraordinary COVID-19 response. FC has supported the full range of EIB group products from massive corporate loans to intermediate loans that are passed on to small and medium-sized companies. It has helped us to develop new products like venture debt. This is an extremely innovative product pioneered in Europe by EIB. If you want to measure, if you want a measure of its potential impact on the European economy, I could give you no finer example than this. It is the instrument with which we have supported BioNTech the German company, together with Americans, that appears closest to producing a COVID-19 vaccine, months before any government or institution in Brussels 
became interested in the thing. We first financed BioNTech with the backing of the FC Guarantee in 2019, supporting the company's cancer research. In 2020, we added another 100 million deal to back the COVID-19 vaccine. Venture debt has been behind many of our health investments, such as Pluristem, a German-Israeli cell therapy company, and Poland's Scope Fluidix for its medical diagnostics. By venture debt, but venture debt is also key to our investments in the digital and green energy sectors because venture debt fills the financing gap for startups whose founders need to expand, but who cannot obtain a bank loan and do not wish to dilute their holding by selling equity. So this is cutting edge financial engineering, and we have used it to support cutting edge technology. Let me give you two more examples, this time from the digital sector. First, on cyber security. Cyber attacks are an evolving danger to organizations, employees, and consumers. And that is why we backed cybersecurity companies such as Klaviser, an innovative Swedish company that develops, manufactures, and sells network security solutions. Our 20 million euro loan supports the development of highly advanced software for next generation firewalls used by enterprises mainly in the telecom market. Recent product development also features proactive detection technology, including fourth generation artificial intelligence that monitors, monitors the behavior of malware in addition to classic antivirus engine techniques. Next, let me tell you about our backing for European 5G development. 5G technology is expected to enable faster speeds, massive connectivity, decade-long battery life for sensors, and super responsive, reliable networks for consumers. This could power virtual reality and augmented reality experiences, driverless vehicles, medical monitoring, advanced industrial automation services, and other applications. In other words, it's the foundation on which all this other innovation will stand. To accelerate research and development of 5G tech in Europe, the EIB recently provided two loans totaling 750 million euro to Nokia and Ericsson, for example, and there are other major loans, for instance, to Telefonica, Tim in Italy, Deutsche Telekom. So why did we start this FC experiment that I have described to you? It grew out of the financial crisis of a decade ago. 2020 seems to have seen crisis piled up upon crisis. So it may be hard to remember that life was not perfect even before this stressful year began. But let me take you back to 2014. Jean-Claude Juncker was then preparing to take over as president of the European Commission. He saw this enormous investment gap, which we could see in, in, in Europe at that time. And it was amazing because we could demonstrate that good projects were there, no doubt, all across Europe. At the same time, liquidity was abundantly available at that time, interest rates moving towards zero. So the question was, why does all this money not flow into these good in investment projects? Obviously, an issue of expectations, uncertainty, and risk. So he and I developed a plan to counter the effects of the financial crisis, which had lingered for years in the form of low investment and a shortage of bank financing. My argument was that the guarantee from the EU budget would allow the European Investment Bank to guard its balance sheet and thus its cheap funding while freeing us also to invest in companies or technologies that had previously been, ris too, been too risky for us. When the bank backed those companies and technologies, our presence would encourage private investors to follow us. And this is indeed what happened. Crowding in became the name of the game. Our economists find that by 2022, investment backed by FC will increase EU GDP by 1.9% and add 1.8 million jobs compared to the baseline scenario. And this is a phenomenal impact on the real economy. 
The post-financial crisis management tool has evolved into an economic development tool. We have been able to bring it to bear on key priorities areas for Europe's sustainable future, such as digitalization, green infrastructure, research and innovation in small and medium-sized companies, as well as an overarching cohesion target. And when new crises emerged, such as COVID-19, FC was part of the emergency response and a blueprint for the new programs developed to counter the economic shock. Nonetheless, it is, has been remarkable to see that the cohesion goals of policymakers have met the markets very happily in FC. The top five FC recipients by GDP are Estonia, Greece, Bulgaria, Portugal, and Latvia. And four out of 10 FC operations from the European Investment Bank are located in cohesion regions. This is proof that cohesion works. When the market called for ideas, cohesion regions answered the call with projects that might otherwise not have been financed. Good economic programs have historically managed to find the right balance between politics and economic cost and benefit. Economic programs need to address real market failures. To be able to do that, you need politicians and policymakers to get a good regular dose of corporate business reality. One of the successful features of FC was precisely this. We used real market expertise through the investment committee which was so ably headed by Managing Director Wilhelm Molterer and his deputy Ilyana Zanova, both of whom you will hear from during this conference. The investment committee members brought a range of business experience from infrastructure fund managers to construction executive and advisors to RDI projects, such as Andrea Codrini, who you will meet in the first panel of this conference. Their view is not theoretical, and thus they were a vital component to the, IC, to the FC process. Let me add that an important component of FC's governance was the work of the steering board, which after all selected our highly effective managing director and deputy managing director. The steering board has been led by chairpersons Kerstin Jorna and Gerasimos Thomas, who have represented the European Commission, and by the European Investment Bank's own vice president, Ambroise Fayol, who will be with you soon here as well. We owe them a big thank you. Now we find ourselves at the end of the FC's six-year program. At this conference, we look back on the investment plan for Europe, and later this morning, we turn our attention to the future with InvestEU. Let me address FC's legacy before I speak about the future. COVID-19 has written an important new chapter in the FC story during the program's final months. But after all, there were already plenty of ways to tell that story, such as been the scope of the enterprise. You might describe FC's legacy with a map of Europe. There are FC deals from Las Palmas in the Spain's Canary Islands, where the FC guarantee backed EIB financing for cleaner buses to Estonia in the north, where FC guaranteed financing of research by skeleton technologies into energy storage supercapacitators. The map might even take you to outer space with the FC-backed investment in OHB, the Bremen-based company developing electric satellites, or by Como Italy, where the financing deorbits works, de work on satellites to carry out climate research in space. You can tell it as the story of a human life, starting with FC-backed financing for Jenawein's biotechnology production of baby formula with the same natural sugars as breast milk, and Science for You, which makes educational toys in Portugal. Take the tale on through school projects like our backing for an anonymous Finnish school, PPP. Ride on to our investment in the PPP to build primary health care centers in Ireland or an investment in the first academic spin-out fund based on research by French universities, which includes promising cancer treatments. Or the story of a business's lifetime with some of the startups and young companies financed with the backing of the FC guarantee, like Winnow, a firm developing artificial intelligence tools to cut food waste at its research center in Romania. 
or tell it from small to big with a family metal molding firm in Western Germany financed by FC, by Euro European Investment Fund with FC guarantee, up to the European Investment Bank's deals with giants like Ericsson, Telefonica and others for their work on 5G. Then the story of digitization. These are projects to finance electric car charging stations in Italy, digitalizing traditional businesses in Spain, researching high performance seeds for crops and that resist pathogens in France, construction of high tech medical facilities in the Netherlands. All these ways to illustrate the EFSA legacy look to the future of Europe with an innovative, sustainable economy. These different EFSA stories are written from the same script in which scarce public resources are used expertly to build jobs and growth for European citizens. Speaking of scarce resources, let me make one more point. The EU will have to invest in its economy massively to ensure the recovery from the current pandemic. We have to wait until it heals the wounds of this crisis, in particular the social wounds. The leaders have come to a path-breaking agreement with the Recovery and Resilience Facility. Now, one thing that is special about this is not only the sheer size, but that a substantial part of this is foreseen to come in the form of grants. This, of course, comes with drawbacks. In particular, the pressure to allocate the resources to, finally, to financially and economically viable projects is lower than in the case of financial instruments. This risks a misallocation of resources, which is, by the way, while the EIB has been barred by its founding fathers and mothers from the beginning on, on from handing out grants. As this is such a unique crisis, we agree this time, and I would say only this time, it makes sense to make use of grants as part of a recovery package. But it, this is not to say we shouldn't care how the money will be allocated at the end. And for the latter, there is probably a lot to be learned from SC, in particular when it comes to drawing in the private sector of the, in, into the recovery. Drawing, drawing in, the, in the private sector will be critical to ensure that our policy ambitions and reality do not part too much. On the one hand, we see that CO2 targets are being increased over and over again. On the other hand, investment activities in the private sector are breaking away. There is a huge contradiction, according to our economic study, which we published just a month ago, between the recognition of the investment needs and the plans of concrete entrepreneurs and policymakers to invest exactly into these fields. There is a huge gap. Something needs to happen to correct this, and member states need to come to grips with this sooner rather than later. And finally, let's not forget that Europe is responsible for only 10% of our global carbon emissions, CO2 emissions, and climate events do not know borders. It is only logical that we all need to significantly increase our efforts also outside the European Union. That is why it could help to address the missing support for developing countries to deal with the COVID while addressing CO2 emissions in an efficient way. These two things belong together. It is fair, I think, to say that the legacy of FC will be found in the way we pursue and realize projects in the public interest in the future. The essential idea of a complex financial architecture that combines the EU guarantee with the activity, ex experience and market outreach of the European Investment Bank is the template and the benchmark for this. Ultimately, the legacy, legacy of FC will be in the livelihoods it supports and the lessons learned by policymakers as they confront the next crisis. I look forward to a fascinating set of panels and talks today. I'm sure you will come away with many great insights. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much, Mr. Hoyer. You have given us a very impressive overview of uh, what the um, uh, European, uh, the investment plan for Europe has achieved and what we could perhaps learn for what lies ahead of us, uh, daunting challenges indeed. Um, we are going, uh, building on this keynote speech, we're going to look back a little bit on the uh, FC and the achievements that we saw there, but perhaps also shortcomings um, with the aim of 
learning from this uh, so that we can look forward later after the speeches of Mr. Dombrovskis and uh, Mariana Mozzucato, we will have a panel um, to look forward. So this panel, uh, in this panel I'm very happy to welcome, or he's already <laughs> welcomed us, Marcel Fratscher, so the uh, president of DIW Berlin, who has uh, um, is a long-standing advocate of more and better investment in Germany and in Europe, so um, very good to talk with him about this issue. We also have Wilhelm Molterer, and we already heard uh, that he has very skillfully managed the investment committee, which basically gave the uh, market insights in order to, um, um, to uh, choose the right projects that really provided additionality. And last but not least, we have uh, Andrea Codrin, who's uh, a CEO of Third Millennium Knowledge and also an FC Investment Committee member who has provided her expertise and can tell us about what she thinks, uh, what went well and where we can adjust uh, in the future. So to start this panel, uh, Marcel, I think I would like to turn to you and uh, put this a little bit, uh, what we just heard, the impressive successes, also the support for, for things like Biontech, who will be very, which will be very important for us going forward, indeed, to put it a little bit in the bigger picture. picture. So you, uh, you for a long time have argue, has argued that there's an investment shortage in Germany also in Europe. We have heard that uh, the FC has done a lot in order to uh, mobilize money for investment and uh, identify risky but uh, investments with high yield. And we've also heard that uh, when we look at the plans, uh, investment plans of companies going forward and the needs for important things like uh, the green transition but surely also the digital transition, there is a gap. So important to learn about what went wrong in the past. In your view, um, so if you've heard about how well the FC functioned, uh, but there was still an investment gap at the European level, what has been lacking from the side of national, but perhaps also European policies, to build more on this success to make sure that there's enough investment to have a um, more sustainable, stronger recovery than what we've actually seen in the past? Yes, thank you. That, uh, is it working? No. Now it's working. Yeah, very good. Um, yeah, this is a difficult question because, um, of course, I I thought this was an excellent keynote by Werner Hoyer, and I, I share generally share the positive assessment of um, of the FC, the Juncker plan. Um, uh, this was a milestone, and I, I remember back then uh, when it was launched, there was a lot of skepticism, uh, in particular also here in Germany, and we said, oh, you know, if this is going to work, and uh, there's no additionality, these are projects that companies uh, would have, well, governments and companies would have done anyway, so uh, what's the point? It's just uh, cheaper financing, but I think the important point is really uh, this has been a success. Um, now. I think now looking into the future, what, what do we need to focus on? You ask about the lessons, where can we be critical, where, we, where do we have to be critical? Um, for me, maybe two points. One is about convergence. Um, and um, Europe can function properly, and this is even more so true for monetary union and the euro, if we have a convergence process. So where the economically weaker economies are catching up where we actually really develop and tap opportunities in those economies and that we haven't seen over the past 10 years. I wouldn't say this is now the fault of FC, I th no, I think this is a much broader issue with many different dimensions but clearly if you now look into the future and if you ask so what can, what, what do we need to do and, and you know where can we do better, I, I would say this is really a crucial element. Um, and uh, now the recovery and resilient uh, facility, uh, Werner Hoyer mentioned the grants component, so there is clearly uh, weaker economies hit harder by the pandemic, get more help both on, on the grant side and the loan side. Um, and I think this is an important step, but I, I would say developing institutional capacity, improving institutions in member states is still the crucial element to make best use of the money and therefore uh, achieve or improve convergence, let's say. Um, so this is to me 
uh, one of the, the crucial elements. The second, and that's really a difficult one, uh, and Van Hoyer talked about many examples in BioNTech and, and others, it's exactly how do we trigger the transformation. And transformation often means we need to do new things, right? And the government, the state, the official sector can provide a good environment. Uh, I would highlight here, in addition to, to uh, a good infrastructure, digital infrastructure, I would highlight education, research and development. I think that's still a bit of a, a weak spot, uh, the, other, the third and final element. Um, one of the really positive elements um, of the pandemic response in Europe has been the joint financing. So I, I'm, originally I'm a, a macroeconomist, so to me having a really coherent and convincing European fiscal framework with rules that make sense uh, is an important re requisite for that to work, for member states to be able to step up, to use those funds in a sensible way to not weaken public investment in their own national environment too much. And this is one of my big concerns. Public debt is increasing a lot now with this crisis. Um, I really hope we won't make the same mistake as we did after the global financial crisis, namely, um, I don't want to call it austerity, government still spent, but the biggest hit was for public investment. And that really weakened overall the European economy, in particular the weaker economies, and it also weakened the impact of, of FC. So I think the impact could have been even more positive if there had been a positive synergy between the European side and the national side. So maybe these three points at the, at the outset is for me what I will take away for the future. So basically Mr. Hoyer told us that uh, with the guarantee, uh, the FC was able to crowd in private funds and you would say we need good public investment infrastructure, education and R&D also to crowd in private investments with future instruments like that. Thank you very much. I should uh, say one thing to our audience who's following on, I think, uh, different channels, YouTube, uh, um, uh, Twitter, and others. Uh, so there is a chat uh, that allows you to ask questions, and I'm following it here with one eye, uh, and we'll try later to, to, to feed in your questions. If you have any, so don't hesitate, talk to us on the, on the chat. And uh, I would now turn to uh, uh, Wilhelm Molterer, who has had been heading the investment committee, uh, which has been so important um, to, uh, we heard, to, to pick uh, projects that have really provide big impact and also additionality, wouldn't have happened otherwise. So um, in, in, in terms of um, governance and rules for the FC, what would you say, what are the main lessons going forward for what we're trying to build now in the European architecture to, to rebuild after the COVID crisis? What, uh, in particular, what was the role of the investment committee that you would like to highlight and can it be, can it be integrated in um, the recovery program? Yeah, good morning, everybody. Uh, best greetings from Vienna. You have heard a lot from Werner Hoyer on the, on, let's say, the story, the story behind. I would concentrate on several issues because what's absolutely relevant to learn the lessons from the wonderful experience FC gave, gave us all. First, it was a comprehensive approach. We are not talking about FC just if we talk about the investment plan for Europe. We talk about the regulatory environment means having an attractive regulatory and predictable regulatory environment to attract investment. The second pillar is the advisory component because we need still advising uh, uh, companies, uh, governments, institutions on, uh, on making projects happen. And third, to have the financial arms FC properly in place. That means the comprehensive picture is for me key. Second key point is, from the very beginning, the concept was a market-driven concept and not a policy-driven concept, but having also policy targets in place, for instance, the climate issue. But the, 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 the FC as such is a market-driven instrument. Third, there have been a clear definition on additionality, eligibility, and investment mobilized via crowding in private capital. I remember vividly when we discussed uh, this uh, multiplier of 1 to 15, 
the skepticism was extremely high, as uh, uh, Professor Fratcher has just said. But finally, via good projects, we really can attract private capital to make these projects additional. Additional means, as you have just said, they wouldn't have been possible to be deployed either not in the size, not in the time, or from the very fundamental principle on the risk profile of the, of the, of the project. The fourth component, and this I find fascinating in the, uh, talking about the future, you have a clear definition of the responsibility of the lender, means EIB group, and of the guarantor, means the commission. The two entities are putting their forces and strength together and the investment committee, the independent investment committee, uh, was playing the crucial role in deciding upon the guarantee based on additionality and eligibility. But this clear definition, here is the lender, the scarce sources we have just heard, and here is uh, the DIB, and here is the, the guarantor of the commission, this is for me one of the key, key elements what we have to learn in the, in the future. The next point is cooperation. You all have just mentioned the question of uh, convergence and cohesion, which I find extremely critical for the future of the European Union. But for doing that properly, you need a strong cooperation with national institutions. Is it national promotional banks? Is it national promotional institutions? And why so? Because you have to take the different economic situations and environment and needs into account. One size fits all doesn't work. You need this strong partnering up with the national institutions to really make and guide the money into the right direction. We also have heard. One key point for me, and I would close here because we, we need also to have a, a, a discussion. That's flexibility. When we started this endeavor, we had a, a totally different economic situation compared to today. But we have inserted in the midst of the course of FC, the climate target, because this was a clear policy target to have the 40% climate contribution in place and we will make it. Or we have started in this year, just in spring, we have heard from President Toya, a huge and serious, a quick move towards the response to the COVID crisis. And this flexibility is necessary because the, the economic situation may change over time rapidly. And last but not least, it's public money. Yes, it's about transparency, and it's about also convincing the public sphere that this is the better use of public money, turning public money into real investment with a higher level of ambition. That's, I would say, are the lessons uh, also for the, for the future. Yes, thank you very much, Mr. Molterer. And I'm now going to uh, turn to Andrea Kodrin, who's also on the uh, investment committee and uh, from Slovenia. So um, um, what I would like to ask you, so we heard a lot about uh, this really worked well in on terms of convergence and cohesion. Uh, the money went to the right places. I have seen other <laughs> assessments, at least from midterm assessments, that it was a bit, uh, um, the money was sometimes a bit concentrated regionally. So it would be interesting to hear from you, from your perspective, uh, from uh, the perspective of Eastern European countries. Do you feel that is, uh, the money has really helped uh, convergence? And in particular, the region benefits quite a bit from EU structural funds. So did the two work well together or was there cannibalization? How would you assess uh, how this worked? Good morning and uh, greetings from uh, Ljubljana. Uh, well, Mr. as Mr. Motorer explained very well, we are not talking only about the investment gap, but as well as the development gap that exists in some parts of the Europe. 
Um, the reality is that uh, if we go towards the project promoters in these regions, we can still see that the grants are competing rather than complementing the other more effective and efficient uh, ways of the financing. Now, uh, the result is that less investments could be addressed and uh, therefore, of course, the impact created is lower. Now, um, the challenge behind is um, that uh, the problem, the, the challenge uh, in the cohesion countries is not the project pipeline itself, but it is the challenge of the sound investment project pipeline. And consequently, then it, we came to the question how to bridge the funding gap that still exists in this part of the Europe, regardless that we have seen the record liquidity in the past years. Now, the investment plan with all three pillars, as Mr. Molterer explained, uh, address all these problems on very systemic way. That means that uh, from the FC on the side to complement with the guarantee, with advisory hub that play, played really a huge role on how to prepare the higher quality of the projects, and finally to remove the barriers for the investment in particular in this part of the Europe uh, to bring back the um, um, uh, confidence of the investors that the regulatory framework will not change uh, after, let's say, the new election, for example. So, um, in um, investment committee of the FC, we have seen several projects coming from this region, also tapping to the innovative way of the financing. As uh, Mr. Hoyer, the president of the bank, mentioned, four out of ten projects actually came from this region, which is very important. Now, uh, could we see more such projects that would complement the structure of funds with uh, the FC? The answer is yes, because this is vitally important uh, for achieving this transformational effect. However, from my perspective, we have two strong uh, challenges behind. Uh, one of that, uh, it's uh, the mindset that still do exist in this part uh, of the Europe. And uh, secondly, is the capacity building of the public ad administration. And we know that both two big challenges demands time, demands political willingness, and it demands persistent. Uh, persistence. However, uh, we don't see this really a lot uh, in the past days. So um, I would say that um, a really a big opportunity is now uh, in front of the investor EU to continue with this uh, systemic uh, approach and uh, to help the development of the projects, to help to boost the pipeline of the projects towards to be uh, available also for the private capital. And only on this way, I would say that we would be able to see that no one will be left behind. I think I, I, I do want to follow up on this because you uh, talked about the uh, important advisory role, so and uh, uh, Mr. Moltera did that too, that there was advice for, for companies who wanted to apply to the funds. It's something that we hear very frequently about EU structural funds as well, that you talked about capacity also in the region, so sometimes it's difficult just to understand the rules, to apply, to get through the process. Um, so, for the financial instruments that are being built now in Europe, uh, can we learn from that element? Could a stronger advisory role be attached to uh, different grants, uh, guarantees, whatever uh, the EU and its different institutions provide? To also uh, foster the convergence and cohesion. Um, from my perspective, this is essential. Uh, because, uh, you know, we are very much aware that uh, the, the capital exists, uh, the, the financial funds exist, but um, as mentioned before, the development of the sound projects these days doesn't only meet the technical assistance, but uh, we need to address horizontally the big challenges, strategic priorities that are in front of us, 
And um, because the Europe developed very great pilots, the cases, for example, for decarbonization of the production, um, the very rapid RDI in some cases, uh, of course, if you are approaching such central point as the advisory hub is, the projects do benefit also from this part of the know-how and of the knowledge. But um, and at the end of the day, I still think that the most important point will be how to improve the project quality uh, in regards to the financial structures, how to address the risk that we would increase awareness that um, different types of the funds and of the capital suits to the different types of the risks. And uh, finally, really to establish further the blending opportunities, because um, the, the, the grants are still very much needed. Uh, because we do have an uh, excellent project in this region, a region with high social economical impact, but their financial viability is usually low. So uh, this kind of the support is needed, and for that also the blending uh, is, is much, much needed. And finally, maybe just a small observation, talking with several project promoters here in the region, the um, the investment value of 25 million might be a little bit high for this, this region, that economy consists mostly from the SMEs, but also there is a lot of potential inside of these SMEs and the venture and the startups. So basically some kind of the investment offices and advisory hubs would be needed to, uh, to be provided also to this uh, sector of the economy. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, turning to, to Marcel Fratscher again, so we've heard, um, we've heard that, um, um, you know, gr grants are needed as well for, for, for uh, weaker regions. You yourself, you said it's very important to have a European financial infrastructure where we make sure that the countries that are more indebted than others not, are not prevented from, from doing public investment. Um, when we look, I've looked a little bit at assessments of the FC and, um, and, and, and some people, at least some assessments said that, um, and Mr. Moltera said that as well, it worked very well when there were good national institutions. Uh, the Deve National Development Bank worked well together with uh, the FCA EIB. Uh, so that can be a good thing, of course, because it can be a, a sort of a lever to promote good policies. But uh, if some countries can't make a progress as much as they should with good governance, they don't have a development in place, it can also hinder um, um, convergence and cohesion. So what could be done about this uh, conundrum dilemma? A very difficult question and, and clearly the most obvious one is strengthening national institutions. Um, and. Um, I, I want to highlight also one example from Germany because I think it's, it's, it's not just a, an issue for some countries in, in the European Union, but it's pretty much for all countries an issue. Uh, and one specific example is, is in Germany we have a very federalist structure where more than half of all public investment is conducted at the municipal level. Um, and we know we have about one third of the municipalities that are over indebted. Um, and they don't have, in many cases, the, the institutional capacity um, to, to use the money that is available, whether it's on a Europe, from a European level, from a European fund, uh, from a cohesion uh, fund, or from, from a German uh, federal or, 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 or state budget, they're not even able to make use of that fund because they don't have the capacity. So the personnel capacity, the uh, institutional capacities to do so. And so I think um, we really need to think how to build institutions at the, not just national, but at the local level. Um, and um, I was heading um, a, an independent expert committee for the German government on investment where we looked at this issue specifically. Uh, and what we found, found was that we need to think a lot more about cooperation across units, across municipalities, for instance. And uh, what holds within nation states could also hold within Europe, uh, across borders, right? So, um, to give you a very simple, simple example, if you have a very small municipality and they now have, they have funding to 
uh, to build a, a digital infrastructure, and that's often done at the municipal level in Germany. Um, they simply don't have the ability. So why not have an institution, that's what one of our proposals was, that basically pools 20, 30 or 50 municipalities say, look, we have an expert, uh, or we have the, the expertise, the ability to advise you how to do this. Uh, we can help you on, uh, on, on legal contracts with the private sector, we can help you uh, on planning uh, a particular project. So, um, you know, I, I think the difficulty and yet the strength of Europe and most nation states within Europe is the, the combination of cooperation uh, at a European level and also the issue um, of subsidiarity. So trying to take the decisions at the smallest possible level, uh, really getting people involved and, and meeting local needs, and at the same time generating synergies and, and getting Europe um, um, learn from one another, generate synergies and improve uh, the convergence process. So to me this institutional building uh, at, the, at the local level uh, is really crucial. And as I, as I said with the example of, of for Germany, this is not just an issue of some yeah, countries in Europe that have difficulty with institutions, it's an issue for every country. Yeah, I, I think I very much agree. I've worked quite a bit uh, at the OECD on, 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 um, on Eastern European countries, and but you can see it anywhere. So sometimes big investments like digital infrastructure or streets or sometimes trains, often municipalities are responsible, but they will do this only once. So it does make a lot of sense, I think, for Europe to think about structures that can advise and... Uh, and bolster the capacity of municipalities in order to be able to draw, uh, to draw on funds, but also implement investments. I think that's that's a very good point, Mr. Moltra. You were gone on at least on my screen for some time, but now you're back, and I'm ha very happy about it because uh, what I wanted to discuss with you. So we've heard a lot about the strengths of the uh, FC, right? Uh, and that's good, uh, it, 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 it had a lot of success. But in order to learn, it's also important uh, always to look at weaknesses. So what would you say, what didn't go so well? And what uh, should um, uh, politicians at the European level who are now building uh, the financial infrastructure to support um, the recovery after COVID, but also the green and digital transition, what should they keep in mind from your you know, failures, weaknesses, whatever you've spotted, that is really something that, um, that can be useful for building uh, institutions and financial facilities going forward. I would, I would say, first of all, it's about the policy priorities. And I fully agree with Raja when he started in defining uh, these challenges for the future, and I would make it for the three C's. Europe has to be competitive, we have to fight the climate challenges, and it's about cohesion and co convergence. This is the fundamental agreement we have to have. Secondly, we have to translate this into the regional needs. Because it's not so that one size fits all, as I have said already, you have still regions, they need to catch up on the classical infrastructure, and again, you have regions, they need to do way more on the 5G. And this has to be translated, as said, in the regional needs. But the policy priorities, it's not European, it's the policy priorities for everybody on every level. Second, the blending. To be quite honest, if you have the grants, it's sometimes a bit easier to spend money than to prepare a project based on financing, financing via financial instruments. The challenge is higher. That means we have to not just unify the legal framework for financial instruments and the grants money, is it RRF or is it structural funds, but we have to incentivize also to combine this. Incentivizing means on all levels, the European but also the national level, and maybe we have to be more ambitious in forcing the managing authorities in the regional, uh, uh, let's say, structures to blend grants and financial instruments. Third, as already was mentioned, and I, I, I'm fully supportive to that, the advisory component on the regional level is key. 
financial advice, technical advice, but also capacity building. And it's not, as Fratja just said, a question of East or South. No, it's a question for the whole European Union. The country I know best, for instance, has still, let's say, a lack of creating exactly these institutions. Capital market, because you need a proper capital market structure in place also to attract private capital. And this is just an example how important the regulatory environment, environment is. These are some of the elements uh, where I see we need a push in the future to achieve these European targets. Thank you very much. I don't know whether it's because uh, because of my screen, but I haven't seen any uh, contributions or questions from the audience until now, but would be very happy to integrate them. So to our audience uh, behind the screens, don't be shy and uh, do contribute your, uh, your questions. I would like to go back to, to you, Ms. Kudrin, and, and, and ask a little bit about this idea that, uh, that uh, Marcel Fratscher brought up. So um, given that, uh, uh, well, public investments often provide the backing for private investments that um, that facilities like the FC wants to leverage, and and you you also said that these two have to go together, and uh, capacity has to be built in eastern in the eastern European regions, but also in other countries uh, quite uh, clearly. Um, so this idea of having institutions institutions that will help with uh, uh, help municipalities or regions um, to um, to invest uh, to implement investments to draw on funds put together the uh, the right financing blended or whatever it may be uh, and then also maintain uh, the infrastructure or whatever um, they might uh, implement and uh, perhaps also bring together private and public sector. Is that something that you think could be useful? Is that something uh, Europe should think about when, when looking forward? Um, I completely second uh, this um, uh, proposal, this idea, um, in particular as it was emphasized on the municipality levels. Um, the, com the country that I know the best is very small and municipalities are even smaller. So basically a few people that are running already all operations now need to prepare everything related to the investments. And um, therefore the first point that the collaboration is needed, uh, some kind of the platform approach to combine these different uh, investments together is much needed. I would add also that um, the pure advisory uh, would not work if we will not also build the knowledge and experience on the local level. Because um, we have seen in some member states that the expertise and experience could be on a very high level or we do have some member states that's really done a lot, I would say, in the past years in this regard. So um, um, the, the approach from the both sides, so with some institutional uh, support and the advisory, but on the other side, um, to have some opportunity to bring this expertise and know-how on the local level would be really good. And this is not something that is not recognized by the Commission if we read European semesters and country-specific recommendations. It is also referring a lot about that, and we also have in the Commission this DG um, uh, reform that is that could address uh, this kind of the gaps that do exist. But the question is, again, the political willingness on the particular level. And thinking about Marcel also talked about the uh, new exchange of experience and sharing of best practice. And of course that exists, you mentioned the European sem semester and it exists there. But it's of course at a very high level, if you will. So do you think there could be more exchange and very hands-on so that countries uh, with a certain good experience, perhaps a good development bank, they go to another country where this governance does not yet exist or whether they've found good cooperation at the municipal level and then they go and they really work with another member country to set up uh, a governance that's more conducive to, to having 
um, high yield investments. Is, is that something uh, that could be considered for the future? Um, this kind of approach, I think, has been applied uh, through several cross-border uh, projects and, and the funds that has been available in the past 10 years, and for sure, this is working very well and the effort should continue. But recently, I really invest some time to spoke with, uh, I would say, the main um, key players in this regards in the country that I'm coming from to understand what on our local level is not working, that we are not approaching more towards this kind of the blending. And uh, sincerely said, I found really the willingness and preparedness and even enough high level of the expertise on the local level or even in, inside of the companies. But um, here we actually came uh, to the issue on the level of the national level. So um, therefore, as mentioned already before, I think that on the both two ways, bottom down and, and uh, bottom up and, and top down uh, approaches are needed. Otherwise, uh, you know, it, it's, it's very good to have some pilot, great pilot on, on the local level base. But if this is not the motivation for the others to join or if the strategic priorities and the political priorities are not calling towards that we do more such investments in the very short time then of course the motivation on the local level uh, will not go towards this direction so you would say you need political commitment at the national level you need this macro pers perspective that european countries exchange with each other and uh, analysis of course of the shortcomings but then also very practical advice exchange of experience and and, and technical help right um, yeah perhaps uh, and again i'm going to press you a little bit on on uh, not on weaknesses but uh, more the lessons learned mr moltera so we t we heard that it the money went exactly to the right re regions, exactly to the right projects, and there was always additionality, meaning that um, uh, these uh, projects wouldn't have gone ahead uh, without uh, the money from, from the FC. Um, but of course, that's, and that's not none of your fault, but it's very difficult to determine whether uh, something was really additional. Uh, yet that was your, your aim and your and it's now your claim that it actually happened. But how do you do that? How do you practically, you in the investment com committee, how do you identify these projects where you say, well, it, it may be high risk, but it's also high yield. And I don't see it happening without us intervening. What uh, does an institution like your investment committee, what can it do in order to make sure that the funds are really well spent? Well, just on uh, two examples, what was uh, just said by Andrea Codrin, uh, also for the, for, the, for the future development on, let's say, the better use of public money. I'll give you two examples. We have had a wonderful instrument in place that's called Investment Platform. This is bundling small projects, for instance, in energy efficiency, into a bigger economic scale, which is partnering then for EAB Group and use, uh, using the guarantee and implemented on the ground. The same goes, for instance, for social housing. The same goes, goes for instance, for, uh, uh, let's say, waste management, water management and the, and the municipalities level. But to design this investment platform, you need a structure that is doing this on the national level. The other example is if you have a PPP financing in a respective country or a municipality, you need also an institution that's advising the municipality X and Y to have this PPP uh, project properly in, in, in place. These are two examples where I see the needs for the, the future. How are we dealing with this issue of additionality? The EAB is deploying, a, a preparing a project. And then we have the scoreboard. The scoreboard is based on this three pillar assessment. Is it economically sound? Is it technically sound? Is it legally correct? But also having the features for additionality. This scoreboard is, let's say, the basis for the decision of the IC. And what's key, 
the scoreboard is publicly available. Everybody can see what's in a specific project. And then the IC is discussing this, sometimes rejecting projects prepared by EIB. And if the committee, the investment committee, is making a positive decision, we have to publish the so-called IC rationale. That means also this is publicly available. And this transparency, to be quite honest, is quite a healthy exercise because it is forcing everybody, the EAB, but also the investment committee, to do it properly. Yes, and you have projects, they are on the very high end, and you have projects, they are a bit on the lower end, but that's normal. But all in all, I can say, yes, it worked. Specific needs, I see, if it comes to convergent and cohesion, this is an effort that has to be strengthened and specific needs I see on the blending side and also on the development of a capital market friendly regulatory envi uh, environment plus the advisory components. We are not perfect, nobody is, but we have done a real good job, I would say, in, the, in, in, in showcasing it's possible to have a better use of public money turning this into financial instruments to achieve a higher impact. Okay, thank you. So, Marcel, what, what, what do you think? So, that, I know at the beginning when this plan was set up, there was a lot of ridicule in the press. This is voodoo, just putting in a little bit of uh, private money and then they count they're going to have 500 billion. But well, they say they've achieved it and, that, and it's additional. Would you say... Is that your feeling as well? And, and, and I mean, of course, it's the dilemma that uh, public po industrial policy has. You want to promote very risky investment, but then you don't know what, what are the best investments, what are the future investments. So do we even need to ask for additionality? How would you assess this from a macroeconomic perspective? Yes, I would say additionality is, a, is an important criterion because um, um, clearly, we, we, we have a market economy, a social market economy in the European Union, and, and we want uh, to uh, stimulate private investment, private activity, and also risk-taking. And I think this is really the, the difficulty, right? So uh, we have talked, Werner Hoyer has talked, that we have talked in this panel about the, the transformation that's needed on these two dimensions, climate protection um, and, and digitalization or digital transformation. Um, and uh, that means we need to develop new technologies, new, new ways, new mechanisms. Um, and clearly the innovator uh, is in many cases the private sector. Uh, I mentioned in my introductory remarks also the importance of, of research and development. And I think that's where, you know, we're talking about synergies between the public sector and private sector. Well, that's why I think FC is so important, right? Because it, it's not just the, the government saying we're doing big infrastructure project, but it's precisely the interaction with the private sector to provide a stimulus and uh, this additionality, additional uh, projects are being undertaken and additional private investment is, is, is uh, generated. Um, and I think that now looking at the future and what are important lessons is how can we in particular get more new companies, startup companies, small companies, uh, create, generate new ideas, how can we stimulate that? And, uh, um, Mariana Mazzucato will probably talk about this later on. We have uh, the examples from the US, but also from many European economies, where you have big public research development centers uh, providing very important underlying research that can be used then by the private sector to generate new ideas. So I, I want to again emphasize this importance of research and development. Uh, this is now different from the FC. I mean, uh, Herr, Herr Moldra will, will, can, can explain this better, but a lot was, of course, on infrastructure. It was not necessarily on research and development. But I think this element I would really highlight, if you want to manage those transformations, we need to uh, develop new ideas. That means taking risks, and some of those risks will fail. Actually, most of those ideas will not uh, uh, not be successful and it doesn't have to be as long as we we have a mechanism um, to have uh, some success stories and I think looking ahead th this is for me the big question how can we uh, help smaller companies people with new ideas um, to to test those ideas uh, and BioNTech is, is one fantastic example right I mean this was initially 
uh, as I understand it, all private money, and then later on public money came in. So again, I would highlight the importance of public funding for research and development to create such synergies. And I do also have a follow-up question here, finally, from our digital audience. So I would say that's a question for you, Tobias Urbin. He's, uh, he's, um, he's concerned about debt uh, and asks, uh, so uh, reducing debt constraints results in less sustainable growth. Uh, is it really the best option to increase GDP via increased debt? And uh, like this, we will always end up uh, increasing government spending. Uh, you argued that we need a financial architecture where we can help um, countries uh, that uh, are already very much in debt to continue to invest. What would you respond to to years old? Yeah, that's a, a very difficult uh, element, but. I, s I would say that the, where we agree, where everyone agrees, is that um, we have, in some European countries, very high levels of debt, which uh, increase with the pandemic dramatically. And uh, I'm not just talking about Greece. I'm to look at Italy. Um, I have no concern about sustainability of that debt. If you look at um, debt servicing costs and the level of interest rates being very low, including the spreads. So even for Italy, even for Greece, there is a great amount of trust in the governments being able to service that debt. But indeed, the question is, are those levels of debt too high so that they become a burden on growth and that they crowd out uh, private investment, right? So uh, that capital is reallocated to the public sector, therefore uh, there being less capital for the private sector. I, I, I see this as a, a key challenge. I, I, so I, my first point is yes, uh, I think sovereign debt is an issue uh, which we need to deal with smartly after the crisis. But as I said also earlier on, I think the, the wrong way is to say, okay, we cut back on public spending, we cut back on public investment, uh, trying to reduce debt. Uh, that actually could be counterproductive because if that reduces growth, um, then actually the debt to GDP ratio might, um, uh, might actually increase or, or at least not go down. Uh, so to me, the first priority must be, can we um, direct public spending towards productive investment that generates growth and thereby higher tax revenues and allowing to stabilize and then ultimately reduce debt to GDP ratios. So clearly, uh, the priority must be to, to, to funnel public funds into productive investment. That's the best way and uh, all other options that are under discussion, the ECB should uh, inflate away the debt uh, or we should uh, increase dramatically, increase taxes. Uh, um, I think, yes, uh, one can debate those, but these are clearly either unrealistic or um, in terms of economic welfare, in terms of economic you know, growth, clearly uh, inferior options that we have. Thank you. And then there's a, a question uh, by Franziska Schütze uh, for uh, perhaps you, Mr. Molter, if you see. Uh, how will the new EIB Group Climate Bank Roadmap 2021 to 2025 change the work of the Investment Committee? And will the 50% climate share target be implemented to FC as well? Something about that. I would fully support what uh, Professor Fratscher just had said concerning RDI. And I'm absolutely I would say so I was surprised seeing the first figures. Originally, we thought that the public sector will be the main beneficiary, but this turns out totally different. 75% of FC projects are in the private sector and with the private sector. And second, the number one beneficiaries is the SME sector in Europe. That's not a surprise. That's key because they are the, the backbone. But the number two is already RD&I, including digital, we make roughly 25% of FC investment exactly in this sector. That means that's really an indication where, it, where, where, we, should, where we should concentrate also in the future on climate and, uh, and competitiveness. I fully agree. Uh, on the question, well, the IC is coming to an end, as FC is coming to an end. Uh, by year end, the investment period of FC is done. IC has done the job and we quit the shop. And this has to be then uh, uh, deployed by the new instrument, 
invest eu and invest eu will have the challenges as we have just discussed the eib group is prepared by having this fundamental change towards being the climate bank also following the the, the needs uh, based on the on the on the new target on the 50 percent uh, uh, climate target that's a very good and important step to be prepared for the needs but the invest eu regulation has to be precisely also uh, on that uh, uh, very concretely uh, managed and, and prepared that invest eu is really doing this that they're sub supporting the policy targets this investment committee is a different one from the current one as said we have done our job by year end and InvestEU will be discussed in the next panel. And I think you have really tackled one of the key questions of InvestEU. How can InvestEU exactly tackle the challenges? Is it climate? Is it digital? Is it social? And it is, is it cohesion? These are the main aspects for the, for the, for the future. I fully agree. Right, so for Franziska Schütze, you precised, uh, you made one thing precise, which is that FC is now coming to an end, but InvestEU would be the follow-up uh, program here. And I think we have one more opportunity to look into uh, the last question I have here uh, before we welcome uh, Mr. Dombrovskis and his keynote speech. Um, so, um, lost my question, sorry, but uh, what? Uh, Maria, uh, Miriam Beretta, she asked uh, well, a similar question um, and not uh, fully directed at uh, as you as the FC Investment Committee, but I'm go still going to ask you, uh, Ms. Kudrin, what you think about it conceptually. She asked, so should the focus be on green investments? And indeed she's asking, should it be in the EU, but also outside uh, middle and lower income countries? Of course, my understanding is that you're not active there, but still, when you think about your green investments, it's important to think about, we've talked about it before, it's important that it doesn't only happen in Europe, but also in other countries. So uh, what would you say about this, this, um, this question? Should this be the focus and what can be done perhaps uh, at the European level to promote green investments, not only with financial fa facilities within Europe, but also somehow beyond? Well, uh, this for sure is an um, extremely, immensely important question because um, I think that uh, if you do any investment today, regardless are you SME or are you authority, um, it should address the climate change, it should address the circular economy aspects, uh, it should address digitalization, and most probably it should also address these all health issues that we have recently. So uh, investment is very long process and basically everything what we are doing today will be able to have the impact in seven, eight, ten years uh, in the future. Therefore, um, I was very happy to see that uh, we had the RDI projects um, that addressed um, also how to green, how to de decarbonize the production, because the Europe uh, depends on the industry. So it's not only about the new products, it's not only about the new services, but it's also what we will do with the current production facilities. And, and, and this kind of uh, the uh, focus on integration of the climate change mitigation as well as adaptation targets inside of everything what we do today, I think is essential without any question. So I really hope that uh, all this will be horizontally integrated into all new funds, into the invest EU all for pillars that will now exist. So because um, I'm sure this is vital for our uh, survival as the citizens, as well as the competitive economy. Yeah, I think that uh, sums up very well the theme of, uh, of our panel. Uh, I want to thank uh, the three of you, Marcel Fratscher, uh, Andrea Kudrin, and also uh, Wilhelm Molterer, that you've helped us to reflect on the strengths and weaknesses of the FC and how that should reflect upon what is being built now. 
for the recovery. I have the uh, immense privilege now to announce uh, Valdis Dombrovskis, who is going to represent uh, the European Commission, and he's the executive vice president for an economy that works for the people. So that sums it up very well, what we have discussed, what is needed now, and we are looking forward uh, to your keynote speech now. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to thank the European Investment Bank Group and the German Institute for Economic Research for working with the European Commission to organize this seminar. Uh, it is a pleasure to speak to you today, some of you in Berlin and some remotely. Uh, let's think back to six years ago when the EIB Group and European Commission launched the Investment Plan for Europe. Low levels of investment were slowing down the EU's recovery from the global economic and financial crisis. We urgently needed to reverse that trend to get more investment flowing and create growth and jobs. The original idea in 2015 was to unlock at least 315 billion euros of extra investments by combining EU budget guarantees and funding by the European Investment Bank with other sources of finance. In 2018, the initiative's achievement justified extending its timeline and investment target to 500 billion euros. Today, in 2020, I think we can definitely say FC has been a success. It has enabled the financing of hundreds of projects and businesses, especially smaller ones, across the wide range of sectors and in all EU countries. The plan has exceeded its intended investment targets and ahead of Schedule 2, helping to reduce the impact of pandemic on Europe's economy. To date, we have triggered 535.4 billion euros of extra investment with 60% of the capital raised from private resources. It shows that public guarantee can generate private financing for public goods. It has addressed the lack of appetite for risk-taking by private investors and provided funds for crucial investment projects. The European Fund for Strategic Investments, EFSI, has supported investment across the EU, creating jobs and raising economic output. What does that mean in real terms on the ground? As of September 2020, EFSI funding translates into support for 1.4 million jobs, more than half a million affordable flats built or renovated, and renewable energy to more than 10 million households. The European Investment Fund has helped to support uh, sustainable agriculture in Belgium, innovative medical technology in Spain, energy efficiency in Lithuania, a new research and technology center at the University of Latvia. FC-backed investment has also supported the development and manufacture of a COVID-19 vaccine in Germany. These are just a few of many examples I could give. Successfully putting the investment plan into practice makes it clear that this success is worth continuing. It applies even more at the times like this, when the EU is going through the largest economic downturn in its history. The European Commission will follow up with another investment plan for the 2021 to 2027 period, Invest EU. It builds on the original investment plan and draws lessons from it too. The key new element is to open up InvestEU to other implementing partners, including national promotional banks and institutions. While the EIB remains our main strategic partner and will implement 75% of the program, we will now involve more local presence to be closer to the market and final beneficiaries. It means that 25% of the EU guarantee will be open to other international financial institutions, such as the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development, the Council of Europe Bank, the Nordic Investment Bank, and also to national promotional banks and institutions like Germany's KfW or the Casa Depositi Prestiti in Italy. This will better serve specific local needs and support smaller projects, as well as reflecting the need to diversify more in terms of geography and sectors. However, the current crisis has raised the level of risk perceived by investors. This means that market allocation of resources is temporary, not as efficient as it could be, and so private investment flows are impaired. 
InvestEU avoids much of this with the advantage of its EU budget guarantees to de-risk projects and crowd in private finance. While it remains a funding instrument driven by demand as well as markets, InvestEU will have a stronger policy steer to make sure that investment flow towards projects that reflect the EU's medium and long-term policy priorities. This will be important for the economic recovery, where we will focus on the green and digital transitions. Uh, both these are top EU priorities and are already built into how InvestEU is designed. For example, at least 30% of the overall financial envelope will contribute to fighting climate change. The sustainable infrastructure window sets a higher target of 60% for climate and environmental objectives. To minimize any negative impact, sustainability proofing will apply to investments above a certain size that have a significant climate, environmental or social impact. Ladies and gentlemen, InvestEU will further boost investment, innovation and job creation in Europe, geared to the right priorities to generate economic growth. So it will be vital for helping the EU to recover from the crisis. The aim is not to get us back to where we were before the pandemic struck, but to take a leap into the future and invest in the future. InvestEU will allow us to do just that. It will make EU funding simpler to access and more effective. It is a worthy successor of its forerunner, which has made such a positive impact on our economy, environment and daily lives. And at the times of crisis like this one, we need its targeted investments more than ever to kickstart and maintain Europe's long-term economic recovery. Thank you. Thank you very much. This, has, uh, this was uh, very good to make the transition from looking back to the FC and its uh, achievements and challenges. Um, and now build on that uh, to look forward uh, to um, uh, invest you and the programs around it uh, that will support the recovery and the um, and the transition, the digital and green transition of Europe. Um, our next speaker is announced for uh, 11.40 and I'm now looking perhaps at the organizers. Shall we make a break or shall we just go ahead? Perfect, okay. So the next speaker is, well, who could be a better speaker to introduce us to, uh, uh, to this uh, um, uh, subject as a scholar? Then Mariana Matsukata, uh, uh, economic scholar from University College London and very renowned and well known for her work that stresses the important role that, uh, that the state plays in bringing about um, innovation and big uh, economic transitions. So I'm very much looking forward to her input now which will set the ground after Mr. Dombrovskis for our next panel where we will discuss invest EU and the green and digital transformation of the European economy. Hello there, I am Mariana Mazzucato. I am the director of the Institute for Innovation and Public Purpose at University College London. Um, and I'm thrilled to be addressing your conference today because it happens to coincide with the launch of a new report that we have done with the European Investment Bank, precisely on the issues that you're discussing today. Uh, the report is called the EIB and the new EU Missions Framework, Opportunities and Lessons from the EIB's Advisory Support to the Circular Economy. And the idea really is that given that the European Commission has thankfully decided to take on this missions approach, which we very much actually helped uh, create through a, a report that I wrote back in 2018 called the Mission-Oriented Approach to research and innovation, the real question is what is the kind of finance that we require in order to foster that? What is the kind of growth that we require? What is the kind of innovation and industrial strategy that we require? So redesigning policies, whether it's procurement policy, industrial strategy policy, uh, fiscal policy and financial policy in order for Europe to grow in a challenge mission-oriented way is you know, a huge theme and being able to work with the EIB around what does this actually mean for its internal decision making, its internal strategy has been uh, not only an honor, but you know, incredibly interesting. 
Um, and you'll recall that Europe has actually, since we you know, wrote this report on mission-oriented innovation, decided on five key areas, mission areas. These are healthy oceans, seas, coastal and inland waters, adaptation to climate change, including societal transformation, cancer seen as you know, widely understood, so also all the preventative uh, areas that we need to focus on, soil, health and food, and climate neutral and smart cities. Um, but also for a long time, you know, Europe has been talking about the need for a circular economy. And the EIB in, in many ways has been on the forefront of thinking about what does it mean to turn itself into a bank that is you know, a climate bank and a circular economy bank that's really fostering all those different areas within different industries. So innovation and investment towards a circular economy, what does it mean for its own ability to provide finance towards that? So the objective of the study was really to draw lessons of how EIB advisory and, and strategic making in-house can be an effective change agent that actually mobilizes the EIB, creates a greater leverage and multiplier effect, um, and especially around these, you know, again, thematic areas. And as a case study, we focused on the role that its own advisory services uh, through in, uh, InnoFin advisory team uh, in the circular economy team of the EIB could be kind of thinking through a lot of these issues. And in fact, that team has been in place since 2014, but given that you know, these missions are now very much at the center of European policy, the question really is now, what does that mean for in-house capabilities and capacity? Now we came up with um, three main recommendations that I'd like to go through um, and then to conclude. So the first is that it's really important to strengthen the long-term orientation of missions to maintaining financial and more importantly, in some ways, analytical market intelligence competencies within the EIB that are able to retain that long-term horizon, but also that are thinking about change today. Uh, because missions are not about completing a goal tomorrow. These are long-term objectives, but they do need to begin, especially now that we not only need a recovery uh, due to the, the COVID pandemic, but also now that we have actually, as a region, globally decided to be more mission oriented. So what does it mean to have missions, to have a portfolio approach, but always really fostering that long-term, that long-term patient uh, financial ecosystem. So balancing the short term and the long term. Second, we need to further strengthen and strategically utilize the role of knowledge creation in the context of the mission thematic area to tailor finance towards its actual needs of different types of innovators and investment appetites of the financial actors. This means being very clear that even though there's a, you know, an objective around the circular economy in a specific area, how then the finance actually reaches specific economic actors will of course depend on what actor we're talking about, whether it's a small medium enterprise, a large company, uh, whether it's a particular industry that is a new one at the beginning of its ind industry life cycle or a sector that is quite mature and actually needs a rejuvenation. Uh, think of the steel sector, for example, which really needs to lower its material content. What does that mean for such an old sector then to implement new techniques around repurpose, reuse, and recycle? That's a very different question, of course, if we're looking at a high-tech uh, sector. So we need that kind of granularity. Third, we need to promote high risk taking by building on existing risk sharing mechanisms like FC and Innofin and relate advisory work of the Innofin advisory to the wider group and the wider ecosystem. But this, you know, we do need to admit this is not about de-risking other actors, but the bank itself actually taking on risk and being less risk averse within its portfolio and also to promote that risk taking culture in house. Uh, so to conclude, just two points. Uh, to facilitate the EU missions, what's needed is, again, patient long-term high-risk finance. And we believe it's crucial that the EIB uses its internal advisory services also more strategically, you know, less outsourcing to, say, consulting companies and more really creating that in-house capacity and capability, what we call in the Institute for Innovation and Public Purpose, dynamic capabilities of the public sector. And it's central that the EIB does this precisely so that itself can become a dynamic, capable, uh, uh, leading actor in the movement towards a, a circular economy and really rethinking its own tools and instruments in order to foster that. Um, we should remember, by the way, that you know, key to mission-oriented organizations 
uh, in the past, like DARPA, which as we all know, came up with the internet, was not only knowing when to turn the tap on for investments, but also knowing when to turn it off. So that ability to be you know, flexible and adaptable, to have key ways to monitor progress is absolutely essential and is required to, um, you know, to be uh, hosted in-house. Um, second, I'm really pleased to see that President Hoyer uh, echoed his full support and his forward, as did the DG of RTD, uh, Jean-Éric Paquet. I'm very pleased to announce that the launch of this report uh, today is, is happening, and especially that you can all download it easily on the EIB website, but also the website of the Institute for Innovation and Public Purpose. We were Again, absolutely thrilled to work with the EIB on this project and going forwards, would like to bring a lot of the lessons to the work we're actually doing globally in South Africa, in Italy. We've been working with the Vatican around missions, around the concept of the common good. How do we monitor our ability to foster change so that everyone benefits as opposed to creating skewed uh, uh, rewards in the system as unfortunately we know has happened in many decades before. So fostering inclusive, sustainable growth aimed toward the SDGs using concrete areas like the circular economy. This is a very exciting uh, uh, area to be working in and working with the EIB on its own intra-organizational uh, metrics and ability to foster that risk-taking has been absolutely a pleasure. And uh, again, thank you very much and apologies for not being there with you today. Well, thank you, uh, Mariana Mazzucato. I think uh, that has very well um, uh, set the ground for the discussion that we are now going to have on, uh, on invest in EU, EU and the green and the digital transformation of the European economy. Uh, so I'm very happy to announce my three speakers, uh, starting with Rita Schwarzelius Sutter, who is a parliamentary state secretary at the Federal Ministry for the Environment, Nature, Conversation, and Nuclear Safety. And I'm sure you've been very pleased to hear how much the mission oriented um, um, uh, um, management, let me call it, of the EIB is going to focus on, on issues that are very dear to your heart. We have Ambrose Fayol, who's the vice president of the EIB and who's going to be able to tell us how he's going to implement um, all of this, InvestEU, but also the mission-oriented approach to, to, to bringing about these investments. And finally, uh, well, who, who is going to do the investment and uh, bring about the, um, the uh, transfer, this green and digital transformation we've talked about, or we are going to talk about, it's of course the industry with its uh, numerous enterprises. And so I'm also very happy to welcome Heiko Willems, who is responsible for industrial and economic policy um, at, the, uh, at the BDE, so the German Industry Association. And uh, well, to, to, to link the discussion perhaps directly a little bit to, to what Mariana Mazzucato just told us and about her report that's going to be released today. So we already did discuss that what is ahead of us is not only um, a recovery, but also a, um, a major transformation um, of the European economy to something greener, to more climate protection, uh, sustainability and the circular uh, the economy. And I was very interested in hearing what uh, Mariana had to say about how you, um, Mr. Fayol, are going to change or plan to change the way you operate uh, as a bank, perhaps becoming more of a risk taker and building more internal capacity to really identify um, uh, the projects that may be risky, but at the same time bring about a high yield if they do, do work out. So how are you going to, uh, to do that concretely? What lies ahead of you? Sorry. Good morning. Do you hear me?
Well, we we seem to have lost two of our speakers, but it will. I think, but uh, I think Mr. Williams is still uh, uh, there. So perhaps uh, um, I'm going to start with you. Uh, be, uh, and, uh, while the others come back, and perhaps uh, uh, perhaps you can talk a little bit about. Just, so you've had a joint declaration with uh, industry associations in France and uh, Italy to basically appeal to European institutions and say what what you need uh, beyond Invest EU and uh, the program that is being set up now in order to be able to bring about this green uh, and digital transition that we've talked about. So maybe you can tell us a little bit about the industry perspective there. Yes, of course. Thank you. Good, good morning, uh, everybody. I hope uh, you will not lose me um, and you, that you can hear and see me. First of all, apologies that Klaus Deutsch is not here, uh, who should be on the program. He's our chief economist. Um, I am um, head of BDI's Brussels office, so I am a generalist. Uh, I am a lawyer by background, so I'm not uh, an economist. Um, but I can maybe add a different perspective on some of these, these topics that we discuss um, uh, today. And uh, as you mentioned, um, we are not in this alone. Uh, we have uh, regular cooperation with our European partner associations. Uh, so there is a trilateral forum with the Italian and French uh, Federation, but of course we also work in Business Europe uh, together and uh, I think we share more or less similar concerns, although the, the basic scenarios in the European economies are quite different when it comes to digital and climate issues. Um, so first, let me give you a, a little bit of an insight uh, about the, the economic impact of the um, uh, pandemic on, on industry, I mean, it has, uh, and it still um, seriously uh, impacts and impairs corporate balance sheets uh, and the profit and loss statements. And the longer the crisis stays, the more companies will move from, from profits to liquidity and then to solvency issues um, in, in the broad area. So it really touches many areas of the economy. And um, so they really face serious problems um, on the short term level, but also we will see very low investments and a very shallow and, and slow recovery of investment because the, simply the money is, is lacking in the companies. So until the pandemic is over and we come to a certain sort of new normal, this will be very def difficult for the private sector to, to recover. And in some areas, we really also we'll see a structural shift um, in demand and supply when it comes, um, uh, let's say, to airlines, airports, uh, tourism, hospitality. Um, I mean, they are uh, hit uh, most hard uh, now, but they will also uh, face serious problems uh, for, for a longer time than other um, parts of manufacturing industry. So what we need now is, is protecting and incentivizing the investment after the crisis um, on a broad scale for all the sectors uh, driven by the recovering markets, if they recover, when they recover, but also supported by public investment. So the markets cannot do this alone. We also uh, need uh, public money. We need strong fiscal impulses um, and favorable financial condition, conditions. This will be key to support uh, the recovery and this is not going to happen in one or two years we will need this uh, for for several years so we will if we want to stimulate investment we need these conditions for five to ten years and um yeah maybe i'll leave it uh like that for a first statement or should i if we have the other speakers i can also talk a little bit about the green and and digital issues uh, we'll get back to you. I, I want to turn uh, to, the, to the Vice Minister now. And uh, because we talked so much, Mariana Mazzucato talked a lot about the importance of sustainability of the circular economy, certainly the green transition, Green New Deal, all these things are very Im important at the European level, but of course also for you um, uh, at your ministry. So perhaps you can tell us a little bit how you can see how InvestEU and the uh, European Recovery 
program more broadly can contribute to the uh, green transition of the European uh, economy and perhaps also how this links to the programs of, uh, of your ministry and indeed the, the entire German government. That would, of course, be very interesting for us to hear. Thank you very much. And um, I want to begin um, to be, describe the situation. The corona pandemic uh, may have uh, presented the EU with the biggest um, economic challenge it has ever faced since uh, its inception. And uh, we must rightly ask um, ourselves how financial instruments like the Invest EU uh, program and the Recovery and Resilience Facility can uh, contribute uh, a green uh, transition of Europe's economy, partly, particularly uh, given the present difficult conditions. And the measures put in place in the EU uh, to contain uh, the con uh, coronavirus pandemic uh, have led to a sharp a downturn within the EU. Um, the GDP is expected uh, to shrink by around 7.5% in 2020. And this is a steeper decline than during the finance crisis uh, in uh, uh, 2009. And it's not only the COVID-19 uh, that uh, is keeping us on the edge uh, in 2020, but also, and it was, um, mentioned uh, by the other speakers, also the climate uh, crisis uh, caused by the climate change. And let's not forget the rapid loss of biodiversity uh, in Europe and uh, throughout the world. One thing is clear, we do not just uh, need smart strategic um, political ideas and regulations to tackle uh, the crisis, but also financial resources. And we have to build back uh, the economic sectors that uh, were hit by the pandemic. At the same time, uh, we are faced uh, with the major task of achieving an even more ambitious EU climate uh, target, raising the EU 2030 uh, climate target uh, to 55% uh, by around, um, would increase the average um, annual investment needed the energy sector alone by around uh, 350 billion euros between 2021 and 2030 compared to the period from 2011 to uh, 2020. So with the next uh, generation EU recovery instrument, the EU has provided um, resources to deal with this with these crises that will make the envisaged economic change, both sustainable and green. And I think um, this uh, is a, a challenge uh, we can um, we can manage, um, but uh, we need uh, now also the willingness of, of all our member states. So I would end with this point. Yes, thank you very much. And now I can see Mr. Fayol again, and I hope he can hear me and we will be able to hear you. Uh, I'll just, uh, since you were disconnected, I'll give you some room to say what you want to say and we'll follow up with a little question then. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay. We can hear Thank you. you very much. And, and sorry for the for the technical uh, technical problem that uh, that that we face. Um, what I what I would say is is the following. Uh, and and thanks a lot for the invitation. I think it's very good to take stock of uh, what FC has achieved, and also um, the lessons we can learn from FC to invest EU. Uh, not only because uh, when we can uh, not reinvent the wheel, it's always good but also because there are lessons to, to be learned uh, for, for, for the future. Um, and I would, say, um, I would say the following. There is something that is unfortunately common in the environment that is around the launch of the SEU compared with the launch of FC, which is that it comes at a time when investment is really down because of the crisis. And this is a risk. This is a risk for competitiveness. 
This is a risk for the economy. We need to find a way to boost investment the way the way FC was able to do that, we need also to do that. And, and the volumes of investments that are announced in InvestEU, I think, will be of, uh, of significant support for, for this to be achieved. The second thing that has changed compared with FC is the decision by uh, the European Union, and in particular the European Commission, to move forward with uh, the EU Green Deal. And the Green Deal is really something that is absolutely central to the activity uh, to the activities of, uh, of of European institutions and and we as the EU bank uh, we have decided to move forward with uh, the, um, the the climate bank roadmap last week the board has, uh, has agreed on on this and it means not only to have more volumes earmarked to um, to to climate projects and I will uh, come back to that later but it also means that you need to make sure that what you do in all your projects is Paris compatible. So, uh, in other words, when you do something with your right hand that uh, is uh, green, what you need to do is we are going to continue to finance projects that, are, uh, that do not have a, a, a climate component. For example, we finance uh, Biontech, and I think the, the president uh, made a reference to that. This is a, a great project under FC. Um, this is not a project that has a climate component, but this is a great project that we need to continue to support. And when you do that, what we need to do is to make sure that following the EU taxonomy that is adopted um, at, at, uh, in mid-2020, we do not significant harm to the climate objectives of climate neutrality by 2050 when we, uh, when we move on, uh, on uh, on, on, on projects that, that, that do not have a climate component. And I think this is something that will certainly uh, be a, a policy-based uh, element that is key for the, 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 the future activity of, uh, of, of EIB and I believe of investment supported by InvestEU in the future. Now, to make it very clear that when we look at, um, at, at InvestEU versus uh, versus versus uh, FC, I would say a, a few things that seem to me as a, as as a member of the management committee of, of EIB, as a member of the steering board of FC, that seem to me important. The first one is uh, we need to make sure that we have the right balance between uh, between banking and uh, and policy based. I mean, we are a public bank, so we need to have the Political, the public policy that has been uh, decided by the by the European Union as as a key element for our for our lending, but we're also a bank, and we need to uh, to finance projects that are bankable, and in, it, it is uh, it, it it can happen that uh, that projects that 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 we would find completely consistent with our our goals uh, do not meet this uh, this this criteria. Uh, the second thing is we need to find also. Um, the right approach vis-à-vis, -vis, and, and it was raised uh, uh, earlier by, by previous speakers, about uh, how to, do we manage to bring additionality to projects? And I think it is, it is a word that is extremely important. We, we are a public bank, so we are not here to finance projects that uh, could be financed by others, uh, and especially by the private sector. Uh, and we need also to make sure that we can do the crowding in, that when we finance a project, we can bring other financiers in the project because because they believe in uh, in 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 what we in what we do and uh, and and that can have the leverage effect that is very important to uh, to stimulate uh, to stimulate uh, uh, the economy. The third thing that uh, that I would uh, I would say is we need to have the right products and I think this is where where FC has been really really doing a very good job and thanks to the. To the teams of EIB who have been uh, in charge of that. I mean, in developing risk sharing, in developing first loss pieces, we find a way that really helps uh, other, other, other investors, other uh, institutions to, uh, to develop product with us. And, uh, and I think that has been really helpful. Now, with that being said, and, and this is a point that Professor Mazzocato has just, uh, has just also stressed, that being said, it has also a, a consequence which is, you know, when we finance uh, great projects like Biontech, when we finance 
projects uh, that that are uh, resharing with uh, with financial institutions so that they can finance much more uh, support for SMEs, for example. Uh, I mean, this is great, but this has also implications in terms of uh, capital, uh, because this is very very capital costly. Uh, and and uh, and again, we are a bank, so this is an issue that we need to. Uh, to, uh, to keep uh, to keep in mind, and finally, I think we need to find a governance that is um, that 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 mixes uh, the policy based, but also that mixes the great input from uh, market participants. And I think this is what the, the investment committee has been able to achieve uh, very well. That uh, they have brought diverse experiences from people that are really working uh, in uh, in in the field on various parts of the projects. And, uh, and I think that has brought a lot of, uh, of good things to the implementation of FC. FC has changed EIB. FC has changed the way we look at risky projects. And, uh, and, and, and I'm sure that with InvestEU, we will uh, we'll continue on this path. And I'll, I'll stop there. Thank you very much. OK. Thank you. So, Mr. Fayol, when, I, when, uh, when you say with your ever so slight accent, everything we do has to be Paris compatible, it's, it's indeed very convincing. <laughs> and, uh, but I do want to have a little follow-up question for you, which I'm also going to pose to the others. Um, it's a question that came from our digital audience, and I think it's a good question. It was directed at Professor Matsukato, but I, I'm actually interested in what you would say uh, to that. Uh, so it comes from Nils Handler, and he's asking, uh, so Marcel Fratscher here, uh, sitting next to me, he has a new book which promotes a paradigm shift towards an enlightening role of science as part of an evidence-based policymaking. And if you would have, as a bank in this case, in unlimited in time and money, what would be the best empirical evidence to marshal support for mission-driven innovation policy that supports green growth? Of course, that's a grand question in some ways, but you said it's important to bring about initiality, and for that you need uh, evidence. And you said, um, you explained very well how your uh, nature as a bank has to come uh, together with the policy base. So it would be interesting to hear what you think about this question. Look, um, I, I think this is, a, this, is a, this is a really important question. There are, for me, there are two different ways to, um, to, to look at it. The first is uh, a sort of a bit uh, retroactively. One of the great success in the FC has been the extraordinary cooperation between DGRTD, the, so the DG research of the European Commission, and the EIB team in charge of these projects. And that has been really working excellently well. And this is, this is how we have been able to develop projects that, that do have, and that are completely science-based, that do have a great component. We have developed a, a, a portfolio of projects for MedTech, for example, actually many of them being in Germany, uh, and with, with projects that have, you know, uh, related to not only to vaccine but to uh, to specific treatments of of, uh, of cancers of uh, of research on 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 many of this uh, this this kind that has been really working well and I think it is a sign that when we can work together uh, when we can be effective in uh, in working together uh, uh, this is uh, this is this is this is uh, for me this is where Europe is uh, is at its best. The second thing that I would say is, um, and, and, and looking forward, I mean, the, the objective of, the, of the, the European Green Deal is to achieve climate neutrality by 2050. Now, what we know already today is that, uh, of course, there are, there are going to be many progress. And for example, when you look at the, the price of uh, the, the wind energy or the solar energy, uh, 10 years ago, 20 years ago, compared with today, uh, this has nothing to do. I mean, the, the, the price has dropped considerably. Uh, but when you look forward, what we also know is that to achieve this climate neutrality objective, we will need, we will need to have uh, innovation, to have uh, something new that we don't know today how it exists. We don't know. They don't exist today, but they will exist. We know that. And they will help and be very helpful to, to reach the, the climate neutrality objective of 2050. So that's why we need absolutely to continue to finance uh, innovation and to continue to see innovation in all its dimension 
be it for climate or for, uh, or for other, other elements. And let me just finish by one example about what a public bank can, can where a public bank can help. And I will take the example that, uh, that actually is, uh, is, is well known in Germany of uh, our role in the wind farm uh, sector. Uh, I mean, wind energy has become really something very important. 20 years ago, it would have been usual to ask EIB to uh, finance or to co-finance projects for onshore wind farm. 10 years ago, it would have been usual, less usual for on-farm projects, but offshore, because they are technically and more risky, more complicated, more risky. Today, there are many projects where EIB can help because, uh, in particular, the volumes of these investments are big, but there are also projects where we don't need any more EIB to finance offshore wind farm because the other investors are, are there for that. But when you, when you talk about offshore floating wind farms, that is much more technically complicated. And this is something that you do when uh, you, technically you cannot uh, base the, the turbines, the, 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 the wind turbines uh, in, in the ground because, uh, because, it is, uh, or because you want to do that further away from the sea. And this is where EIB can help. So what I would say is this is also something that needs to be seen in dynamic. Uh, this is not something that, that is, uh, that is uh, set in stone for, uh, for, for the future. We need also to, uh, to look at ways how we can evolve in the way we support and help uh, projects to develop. Perfect. Thank you very much. And now, uh, perhaps a little bit with the same question, uh, but also an add-on, I would like to turn to the Vice Minister, because of course, um, so you've talked about uh, mit climate change, uh, uh, mitigation and um, um, and uh, and well, reducing, keeping in check uh, climate change, but also biodiversity, protecting that, um, and of course, uh, with an economy that's so much based on uh, well, st still also uh, fossil fuel energy, but also the car sector, we do need uh, major transformations and innovation. Uh, so, if you had all this money and time for evidence-based policy, well, what, yeah, what would you do to build this mission-driven innovation policy, if you want to answer that question? But perhaps also, uh, you can say a little bit more how your policies, how they connect uh, uh, to the European Green Deal and how they can best uh, um, complement each other. Yeah, thank you. And I want to start uh, with the um, science evidence um, policies. It is very important uh, for our society and the discussions in our societies, uh, because you see a lot of uh, populists uh, which deny climate change uh, and the climate crisis. And so, uh, th therefore, it's important that we can show what will happen if we do nothing? Uh, not only that we have droughts and floods and so on, but also what will happen with our economies? Uh, which costs uh, uh, will uh, affect our budgets? And uh, we can't um, 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 bring the, the external, um, we can't uh, deny the external costs or uh, and um, show at the end uh, we have nothing done, so therefore it's it's important that we can say that are the right investments we do now because we don't want only uh, to tackle the uh, climate change, but also um, uh, to bring our societies uh, into the future and that they will be competitiveness uh, with their economy also in the future. So that brings me back. Um, what is needed uh, and uh, what to do we with all the money? Um, first, I think uh, we need the right frameworks and one of the right frameworks is also raising our EU climate target um, by 2030. The, that's, that's very um, important because um, not only because we have uh, the Paris Agreement, that's very important and I think that's um, with all the member states of the UN, that's that's really, um, and with a few to the uh, the United States, I think uh, I'm looking forward to that we have a new momentum uh, for the um, Paris Agreement, but also uh, in the EU. So uh, first thing is we have um, 
raising our EU uh, climate target. And uh, you also mentioned uh, we have also the uh, 17 sustainable uh, development goals um, of the UN. And uh, there is also uh, in the in these um, SDGs is climate change and uh, clean energy, uh, as well as uh, biodiversity, uh, water protection or social, uh, social justice. And this can only be achieved if private and public uh, financing becomes more climate friendly and sustainable. And uh, I think there are three points I want uh, to mention. Three aspects uh, are key to financing the green transformation. First, we need a timely adoption of the recovery and resilience package. It's now up to the Council uh, and the European Parliament to find the right balance between the need to rapid investments of funds and the goals and of the Green Deal and environmental uh, transformation. And the Council and the Re uh, European Parliament have already adopted uh, negotiations positions for the upcoming uh, trilogue. The second point I want to mention is we need to adopt a more climate friendly EU budget from 2021 to 2027. And uh, by the end of uh, the year, the EU intends um, to approve its next budget for the years uh, I mentioned. One major um, accomplishment uh, of the negotiations is that the existing climate quota for the current EU budget is set to be increased from 20% to 30%. And the third point is um, the adoption of classification system for sustainable economic activities. So, um, Mr. Uh, Fayol uh, uh, sp uh, spoke about uh, taxonomy and uh, the EU uh, taxonomy is the first major step towards more transparency and a uniform understanding of sustainable investments throughout the EU. And it's also important for the private sector, uh, for the funds, uh, and we wanted the, to use the leverage. And therefore, the taxonomy system is uh, crucial uh, by to, to finance all the uh, sustainable projects uh, in the member states of the EU. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, I'm going to turn to our industry representative again, um, perhaps with a twist of the question that I threw into the round. Um, so, of course, uh, evidence-based policy making is, is not your business, but your, uh, um, you um, work with, have to work with the consequences. And, uh, of course, we, we've heard a lot about uh, the big transformation that the European economy needs to make in the green areas, but also others. Um, and that uh, somehow the EIB um, has to see a little bit, generate innovation, and that also means in some ways picking winners, right? Deciding on what could be successful, taking uh, risky decisions. So uh, are you... Um, um, do you see that mainly as an opportunity or do you also see dangers that uh, perhaps uh, things will go in the wrong direction or there will be, it will distort markets? How, how, how do you see this, um, um, the balance of uh, uh, opportunities and risks vis-a-vis uh, -vis this framework as an industry representative? Thank, thank you very much. So first of all, we are also, of course also very much in favor of uh, evidence-based policy making. Uh, and this as a lawyer reminds me of the better regulation agenda of the European Com uh, Commission, which we very much support because uh, we believe that uh, it's very important to, to make decisions, political decisions um, on, on facts. But um, so this means research, studies, impact assessments, discussions with stakeholders uh, from, from all sectors. So this is, of course, very important. But in the end, these are political decisions uh, which have to be taken by majorities in a democracy. So uh, evidence is, is very important. But in the end, um, politics have to take a decision on, on certain issues. Um, turning to your questions, um, picking winners, um, 
or, or the role of, of the state in this area. I mean, of course, the state should not pick winners when it comes to individual companies or individual actors in the market. That's always a difficult issues, uh, issue. And um, this is something uh, that we would oppose. On the other hand, directing money into certain directions uh, and areas uh, for the common good. Um, and, and again, this has there have to be political decisions, which are these areas uh, which are important, uh, is, is a different issue. And this is, of course, uh, important. When we come to the digital and green transitions, there are many areas, many projects which are important, which are right, but which are commercially not viable. Digital, let's take digital infrastructure in rural areas, quantum computing, um, cyber security. Uh, the, these are abs absolutely essential, but not everything is uh, commercially viable. So there needs to be certain public support by um, the European Union or by national governments. And the same applies, of course, for um, the green transition, because um, many things that we will need to become climate neutral um, are not commercially viable uh, from today. I mean, it is possible to produce a green hydrogen, to produce green steel, but it's very expensive at the moment. So we need uh, the investments until these uh, technologies become um, uh, become marketable, and um, and this this is very important. So um, maybe if 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 I may, um, we need, but we need also a, a, a reasonable approach. It's a transition. It's not a disruption. So when it comes to to finance, uh, let me take the example of hydrogen. Um, we will need infrastructure for the distribution of hydrogen. So this is an important investment, which will not be covered by the markets alone. So there is public investment needed. But at the moment, there is not enough green hydrogen to use the infrastructure. So our suggestion would be, well, build the infrastructure and uh, for hydrogen um, and be not too strict, be more flexible um, on the kind of hydrogen which is used in these networks. Um, at the moment, it may be green, it may be blue or turquoise or whatever colors of hydrogen. It will become green afterwards, but you first you need the infrastructure. So I think there, you, there flexibility is needed for a transition. Um, but of course, money, public money can never replace the market. And uh, it cannot replace private consumption. So we need also the uh, uh, private um, uh, private money. And we will we are coming now to the sectors which really touch the invid individual. So we have done a lot of things in the industry and in the energy generating areas. But now we are coming to agriculture, um, to transport, and to housing. And so these are areas, especially transport and housing, where people have to make individual decisions. So there we also have to support this by public money, but because in the end it will be the individual who has to replace his car or he has to renovate his, his private home. So uh, it's, it's very much an interplay between public and private money. And finally, if, if I may add this point as a lawyer, uh, money is is not everything. So we need um, uh, the, the technical and uh, the legal environment to implement and and to manage the transition. Um, for instance, our chemical industry sector has calculated that they will need uh, 628 terawatt hours in renewable energy to become climate neutral. I, I am not an expert. I don't know what a terawatt hour is. It's something with very many zeros, but it's the entire energy consumption of the Federal Republic of Germany now. So this will be needed in renewables only for the chemical industry in the 2040s so that they can become climate neutral in 2050. Um, so this is a huge, it's a huge challenge to rebuild this capacity only for one sector. I mean, we have to multiply this, of course, for other sectors. And of course, we need lots of projects and investments um, which have to be 
um, conducted, of course, in a, in a legally safe way. And so we have to find a balance. You know that infrastructure projects in Germany are not so easy, looking at airports, stations and other issues. Um, so uh, we really have to carry that out quickly to, uh, to do this in the next 20, 30 years. Thank you. So, Mr. Fayol, you have a daunting challenge ahead of us, you and other European uh, institutions. We do take some questions from the floor, our digital floor, and I have one which is quite precise, uh, but if somebody can answer it, it's perhaps you, Mr. Fayol. It's Quentin Heilmann, who's asking, there currently is a divergence between EIB energy lending criteria and the taxonomy concerning gas. Yet the Climate Bank Roadmap plans an alignment. Will there be a full alignment, and if so, when? So it might be too precise for you and not your uh, area, but perhaps you have, uh, you have an answer or elements of an answer to that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I, I, I'll come back to that in a minute, but let me just say that uh, I, I, I think uh, the points that have, that have been made uh, before are, are very important. and and. Um, for example, let me let me come back to digital, um, because for me this is a good example of uh, how a, a public bank like EIB can be active. Uh, investments in the digital world are very very important, and and uh, and, and huge needs are, are there. At the same time, um, there are many investors who are ready to do investments in, in digital in dense areas. This is where, frankly speaking, I'm not sure you need EIB to, uh, to, to invest. In less uh, dense areas where, uh, you know, there are uh, less people uh, uh, living there, then there may be a, a bigger added value and a bigger additionality of what, uh, of what uh, institutions like EIB are, can, can do. And this is the kind of uh, differences that we try to uh, to do in, uh, in in FC projects, and then we will continue in uh, in investing. You now back to your question on gas. Actually, the gas issue was um, one of the, the the key elements of uh, the energy lending policy that has been approved by our board, so by the member states, uh, last November. And uh, one of the elements in the energy lending policy is that as of end uh, 2021 we are going to stop uh, financing uh, gas or fossil fuel projects, which for us means basically uh, gas, when the gas level is above 250 grams of CO2 per kilowatt hour. That is on the uh, life of the project. And uh, for example, if you have projects where you start with slightly higher level, but when, when times come, uh, there will be more and more green gas to be in, in, included in the in, in the in the pipeline, that is something that we could uh, still uh, still finance. Um, so I, I, this is not an issue that we have revisited in the in the in the in in, in the current uh, uh, in the current uh, climate bank roadmap because uh, this was decided last year and this is consistent with the with the with the EU uh, EU regulation. Um, let me just say that uh, because I think it's important that we for for FC for the green recovery, for uh, all these uh, this energy uh, uh, projects, for all the, the climate projects, we will be successful if, uh, if we have the way to have uh, no one left behind. This is very important that we, we, we give uh, advisory, that we give technical assistance, that we discuss a lot with the authorities uh, in countries that have the most uh, to uh, to do to come to a climate neutrality so that we can we can be successful for uh, for the European Union. This is an issue for all geographies. This is one of the lessons that we've learned from FC and is going to be absolutely essential for uh, for the, the 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 climate bank objective of uh, reaching climate neutrality by 2050. We need to do that everywhere in Europe and to help those who are uh, the most needy in that. FC has invested a little bit in, in universities and research there. So he's 
I'm I'm sorry, but uh, I I I I couldn't uh, I couldn't hear the, the the question. I think it is related to uh, are we uh, competitive in uh, in Europe compared with the the US and uh, and and China? Is it the is it the question? Yeah, it, it may be because um, I, I don't hold my microphone, right? Sorry, yes, it, it's that, are we competitive? But specifically, uh, uh, the question was um, directed at uh, universities. Um, so do our, univer are our universities competitive and do we invest, need to invest more into research and development, but also education there in order to be successful with this um, transition? Well, thank you very much. I mean, this, this, this is a key question. Uh, and uh, and actually we um, I mean let let me tell you what what we try to do. Uh, what we try to do is uh, invest in uh, universities uh, for uh, for for especially for its infrastructure. Uh, we do a lot of these projects uh, throughout Europe to try to make universities in Europe attractive for the best uh, researchers and. Um, and have also actually in the way we we, we finance these projects to have a, a climate component that is big in the in in in, in the renovation or the building of uh, of new universities. But absolutely, I think it is it is very important. We try also to develop uh, or to or to support when we can the links between uh, the the university and the innovation and and the and the ecosystem. We've done that, for example, by supporting the climate chair of the European uh, University uh, in, in Florence, the, EI, the EUI. Uh, so that's, that's, uh, that's, it, is, it, is, it is true that we need to, uh, to, to do a good job uh, in, in f funding the universities, in uh, making sure that, uh, that, that you get the best working conditions for the, for the best uh, students to uh, to want to, uh, to to go there and then to move from university to uh, uh, how to finance with, uh, for example, with uh, a startup, with business angels, etc. Projects that that are developing innovation while you are in at uh, at, at a university as, as a student. Now, what I would say in terms of a more general nature, I mean, it is absolutely key to be able to continue to finance innovation to uh, to uh, to to stay to stay as much as we can in uh, in 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 financing projects related to innovation we are not in advance in europe compared with the us and and china and when you when you look at the figures for uh, expenditures in terms of research and development to uh, to gdp uh, we are not uh, in advance uh, there are other countries that uh, that uh, that that develop that much more than we do and uh, Whenever we can support research and development, whenever we can support innovation in all in all areas, uh, we need to do that because this is the best way to prepare for the future. Yeah, I almost want to pose this question to the vice minister as well. Of course, yeah, you're not uh, you, um, uh, higher education and research and development is not your direct uh, area of, of where you make uh, are a policy maker. But still, it's of course because innovations are needed for this uh, climate uh, transition, green transition, and uh, and other things concerning the environment. Do you think that's that's key also that you work well together with uh, um, with uh, policymakers that uh, have the responsibility there to invest in in universities and research and development? Um. Sure, because uh, if we talk about sustainable um, economies, then we have uh, to look all the, the areas, uh, the social, the economic, and also the ecological, and therefore education uh, plays uh, a very important uh, role. And um, my ministry, uh, we uh, occupy with uh, digitization and also uh, with um, the, the opportunities and we have an, um, the digital policy agenda and we support um, startups or we, we young, uh, young people um, who have uh, clever ideas how we can shape uh, digitization. So we, we try to connect 
we are not the education ministry, but we try to connect um, the knowledge of young people with uh, the challenges we face. Also, we support uh, students uh, from all over the world uh, to um, to bring the the topics like um, climate change, biodiversity, uh, in connection with the German Foundation uh, for Environment. Uh, every year we support uh, uh, students. So I think um, my ministry has uh, very uh, already um, um, known that this is very important and that we can use this. And I want to come back uh, uh, because uh, Mr. Fayol um, and others told um, sometimes um, it's not so cheap, uh, some uh, technologies, but I think at the end, on, on the pathway to uh, climate neutrality, we have also to face with uh, CO2 pricing. And uh, therefore, um, I think we can show that uh, to invest now, uh, in the right investments, in, in green investments, in sustainable investments uh, uh, is crucial and uh, elementary because if we don't, we have stranded assets and we, we can't allow this because the money in, in, in this, um, in this um, uh, high uh, uh, regions, that, that's not... not uh, um, uh, second time uh, to invest uh, for uh, in in the economy. So I, I want to to promote that uh, the investments uh, we need now to uh, um, build back our uh, economy and uh, to make it uh, and make their uh, make it more competitiveness is is uh, there is no uh, other um, solution. So uh, I think we we have to uh, accelerate now our efforts that uh, because the crisis need now the the investments uh, and we have to decide now about green or sustainable uh, investment, not in, in five or in 10 years, then we have uh, investments in, in, in the wrong technologies. And I want to say we have the challenge in Germany with our automotive industry. That's really a challenge because the structural uh, change uh, was ongoing. Now with the crisis, we have uh, a lot of problems. And now we have to decide uh, what sustainable infrastructure we need, like charging um, infrastructure, uh, what have we? Uh, uh, what uh, incentives we we need now uh, for uh, also for the, the the demand side and also um, for the industry? So I want to promote uh, that uh, we have no time to lose uh, to do now the right investments. Yes, a very uh, strong plea for setting the right framework, conditions, for, uh, incentives, pricing from the side of, of policymakers. Um, so uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Mr. Fayol, Vice Minister, and Mr. Willems, for, for sharing your insights. Um, I will now pass on to Iliana Zanova, the Deputy Managing Director of FC, who will have the task of pulling it all together and tell us uh, what we've learned from, from what you told us for uh, Europe's future. Thank you very much, Nicola, uh, and uh, good afternoon, everyone from uh, rainy Luxembourg. I must say that my task would be very easy because um, the panelists kept my attention for the entire period of time. It was a very enlightening, very interesting discussion. And as you suggested, I will present uh, the conclusions, at least my takeaways from today's discussions. I have decided to do so by grouping those conclusions in, um, in four groups. What are the uh, achievements of the investment plan for Europe? Uh, what are the lessons learned uh, as we launched InvestEU? That's the second one. The third one is uh, what role InvestEU could play to overcome the current health and economic crisis, which is caused by the COVID-19 pandemic. And the last point is what uh, how do we achieve sufficient investment to ensure the green and digital transformation of the uh, European economy? 
So I will start with the first point, uh, and I think uh, uh, the achievement of FC were very well presented by the President Hoyer, President, Vice President Fiol, Willem Motor, and the rest. And um, I would not really get into the economic impact because they were clear, but what I would like to, uh, to emphasize are three points. As the President Hoyer said, I think we shall remember that thanks to FC, we have transformed the way public support is used to catalyze investments and crowding private capital instead of one, uh, one of grants and hence support projects with very high additionality for the growth, European growth, for creation of, of jobs. And I think it also transformed EIB uh, uh, big time. Uh, uh, Ambroise mentioned that uh, a few times, but I think that EIB now is really ready to be the partner of EU uh, in implementing InvestEU and the other programs. The second point, I think it's very important to know that FC has clearly demonstrated that an economic recovery package could be fully in line with sustainability objectives. We had objectives set by the parliament to support at least 40% uh, of climate projects. And we have achieved it. We actually exceeded that target. So the, today the question is not recovery or green. Today, the point is recovery should be green and we can do it. And the last point, um, FC was deployed very quickly into the real economy. And when we talk about crisis measures, it's important that we set up an instrument that could really uh, be deployed fast and reach out those businesses uh, as soonest. And why we have managed to achieve that three points, it was a market driven instrument with very simple management rules. The structure of the instrument was very fit for the challenges we had at the time. And I think thanks to the professional management of EAB group, you know, with the processes, people, resources, capital, and the cooperation with the European Commission, National Promotional Bank, we managed to um, achieve that. And I think Ambrose was very, uh, very uh, open about how important the cooperation is among the MPBs and the European Commission and EAB. What are the lessons learned uh, for, uh, for InvestEU from EFS experience? I think we should not really copy and paste FC into InvestEU because we are, we are now facing very different challenges than what we had in 2014. And uh, Heiko and Rita were very clear on the economic challenges the company isn't facing. Thanks to COVID-19 pandemic, we also have a huge health and uh, humanitarian crisis in, in some countries as well. And what is important to, to, to know is that this crisis exacerbated the structural issues we were already facing before the crisis, low level of digitization, insufficient deployment of new technologies by the European businesses, the need to tackle climate change, the need to step up our investments in human capital, education, skills, healthcare, research and innovation. And as VP Dombrovsky said, that is why InvestEU will, be, uh, will have a very strong policy steer to uh, ensure that the EU long-term policy objectives are reflected, which is growth based on green, digital and, and, and social investments. What we can take from FC here, I think flexibility to adapt the instruments uh, and the financial products to evolving market needs. You know, seven years is a very long period of time. We have to be able to very quickly adapt where market changes. And I was really impressed to see how Quickly, we respond to the COVID-19 crisis with, uh, with EFSI. Within two weeks, we were managed to, to support the right projects, not only for companies developing current vaccines, but also the much needed liquidity support of, of the European businesses. Uh, second, we need to rely very much on the ability of the AB Group and uh, the national promotional banks and their management and skills in selecting the right projects. And last but not least, to uh, you know, ensure additionality and that we are not distorting the market, but actually crowding in. Um, the third, uh, the third uh, conclu set of conclusions is what role InvestEU could play to overcome the current health and economic crisis. And I think Rita already mentioned uh, uh, generation uh, uh, stimulus package that have been put together and hopefully approved uh, fairly soon, uh, thanks to the leadership of the German presidency. So we have this huge unprecedented stimulus package and InvestEU shall be uh, you know, considered as being part of it. 
On one hand, we will have the stimulus, fiscal, uh, uh, fiscal stimulus by recovery and resilience facility, which will be implemented by the public sector. However, InvestEU will have a very important role to play, and this is to complement the fiscal stimulus package through sustaining risk capital for the benefit of the private sector, so that we can support the European entrepreneurs that will develop the strategic sector of the European economy, build the innovation leaders of the future, and support the small and medium enterprises. I think this is where InvestEU could play a very, very important role. And my last Set of conclusions is how we achieve sufficient investments to ensure green and digital transformation of the European economy. Here I've made a few, um, few points. First, as Professor Fratcher said, uh, synergies. We have to generate synergies. This is absolutely key to ensure that we have synergies between the national European actions. We need to be able to use smart the public finance that is uh, 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 catalyzing all these investments in the form of grants, in the form of financial instruments, and create the right risk return profile of investment that actually makes sense and are key to our competitiveness. And of course, again, use, rely on EAB Group and national promotional banks to implement uh, these important initiatives. My second point is, uh, again, Professor Fratcher was uh, very, very clear on this one. Create an enabling environment for businesses to grow in the EU. What we need is to strengthen institutional capacity, to reduce fragmentation, especially in the area of, of, of services in the EU. Um, digital single market, market is key, capital market is key. And that leads me to my next point, advisory support. Again, Andrea and, and Billy Malterer, uh, 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 Mariana Mazzucato mentioned this, we need to use smart advisory support to tackle those capacity constraints at the level of the member states, but also at the level of the project promoters. Uh, last point that I want to add from myself, it's involving capital markets, because by funding Next Generation EU through issuing bonds, and we heard that the president, Ursula von der Leyen, wants to have at least 30% green bonds, social bonds we're already seeing on the market, the EU will unlock the full potential of the capital markets to achieve the climate goals and sustainability objectives. And I think this policy initiative will really um, fast forward the change of mindset of the private sector to really uh, make a stronger contribution to our sustainable, uh, sustainable objectives. And I think Europe is really well placed to, uh, to, uh, to be at the pole position in this role as the euro is already a leading uh, currency globally and, and in green finance. I will stop here. And before I uh, pass back to, uh, to Nicola, I wanted to just mention that Willem and I, together with our colleagues from the investment committee, we have prepared a legacy report on FC where we have shared our personal experience from the very start to the very end. Um, we have the lessons learned, what worked, what were the challenges, uh, what could have been done better. You could find it online um, on the EAB website, it's called FCD Legacy, and I hope it would be useful for the policymakers, national promotional banks, uh, European Commission to just, uh, you know, take a stock of, uh, of our, um, our experience. Thank you very much. Thank you uh, very much, Iliana. I think, uh, Iliana, I, I have nothing to add because you summarized the discussion so well. Let me just uh, uh, say thank you to all the participants. I've enjoyed uh, this morning very much. It was a nice uh, um, um, setup and uh, very, uh, uh, very good and interesting speakers. So I think we've learned a lot about what we can learn from FC and uh, which uh, lessons we have to take forward when we build InvestEU. Thank you very much and, uh, and have a nice afternoon.